There's been a lot of activity in the data world over the last few years. And a few weeks ago, I had a video where I just went through and answered a few questions kind of on the fly with some ideas. And so I figured this week I'll do the same thing. So with that said, I'm just going to hop over to the comments and start reading through them and talk about them. And we can go from there. And again, hopefully you'll find that helpful. All right. So the first one here is from Chris withheld two years on, and I'm reading that MS Microsoft fabric is by this definition, an offering of a traditional data stack. Would love to hear your thoughts around how useful or successful this Microsoft approach is to offering data tools in 2025. All right, really good question and actually very timely at the time of this recording. At the end of the day, my general thoughts on this are that the strategy is more important than the tooling themselves. You could have the best tools in the world, but if the strategy is off, it doesn't really matter because it's gonna be a mess. So how are you handling your naming conventions? How are you organizing your database? How are you scheduling things? How are you going about your data modeling? These are concepts and things that can live outside of Microsoft or Fabric itself, their strategies. So those are the kind of things that I think about. And those are my thoughts on this. And I do think it's kind of timely because at the time of this video, it's October 2025. And recently, two really big tools in the modern space, as you would call it, would be DBT and Fivetran are merging. They just announced that this week. So pretty timely. And I think that tends to, it seems to be the direction a lot of things are heading. We had all of those individual tools that are starting to consolidate a little bit, which I think is a natural progression. Whether that's good or bad is up to your opinion on that. I think you can do well with Fabric, but at the end of the day, strategy is what's most important. Thanks for the question. All right, thank you for the great job. Do we need to create a snapshot for every source in a DBT project, especially industrialized project? So this video is on creating DBT snapshots. A snapshot in my mind is, so the short answer is, I would say no. Some people would say yes, it, it kind of depends. In my opinion, I usually don't recommend creating a snapshot for every source. So a snapshot, is going to track history of a source table. So if you have information that you don't wanna lose over time, or you wanna track you know, a slowly changing type of data source, you can implement a snapshot and it will work really well out of the box for that. I just think it's extra overhead to do it for every source because it is an extra file you have to manage. You don't wanna drop these ever or else you're gonna lose that history. So I would say try to only use them when you feel it's necessary. And then you know if you feel like you need one to add one later, you, you go ahead and, and add it. It's not really that difficult. I mean, the sooner you start, you do get more history. But I find a lot of times teams want history, but they don't really ever use it. And just from a data team maintenance perspective, I tend to lean towards only add on things as you need it when you prove the need for it. So I would say, no, you don't need it for every source. Try to go with it without and then add it in later. Okay. When applying logic from a dimension table, for instance, aggregating booking dates per user ID, should this be implemented within the DIM booking CTE or deferred to the final CTE? And this is a video on creating a data model with DBT and creating a fact table. It's hard to give specific answers for, you know, maybe a specific type of logic. I don't have the full context. What I'm going to assume the question is revolving around here is, are you creating metrics in a separate CTE or all in the final CTE? And what I would recommend, if it's a specific type of aggregation, I would do it in its own CTE and then bring it into the final one so that the final CTE is really mostly just selecting the final columns. You're not doing too much customization there. Of course, it always depends, but if you're doing specific blocks of code or blocks of logic, keep it in a CTE and then just bring it back in for your final select. And again, the final CTE is just to return the column list that you want. That's how I think about it. But thank you for the question. Hopefully that helps. From Blade, you should talk about how not to have a circular write when Salesforce is also a source of your EDW. So this video is on reverse ETL, which is going to bring data from your data warehouse, let's say, back into a source system, into an app. So into Salesforce, for example. So in theory, you could have a circular write. Maybe you're bringing one column in and then you're bringing it back into populating a column in Salesforce, which is then getting brought back into your warehouse. And I, it's a good call out. I don't have a ton of experience with that specific scenario. Maybe there's ways you could handle it with naming conventions. Maybe the name of a Salesforce column or data point has a specific naming convention to indicate that it's coming from your data warehouse, something like that, so that you know. But good call out. Again, I, I'm not super experienced with that scenario, but I think it makes sense. Nice video, bro. Thanks, Albert. 
Have you thought about doing some project reviews? It would be great if we could send you stuff we're working in and get some feedback by someone that has real experience in the industry. I mean, yeah, feel free to leave a comment. I'll do my best to, to come through. Um, this is kind of what this is in a way. There's only so much of a project I can review that that might get a little too in depth, but happy to answer where I can leave some comments, maybe on this video, if you see this and then we could talk through it in the future. But thanks for um, the, for the comment. And I see this is on the last video that was like this. So maybe you found this really helpful and we can continue this on maybe some more project level comments. So again, I would just recommend leaving a comment on that. All right, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is old technology, no? Modern cloud tools like DBT and Snowflake are a little more user friendly, it seems. So this is a video on, this is one of my original videos on creating an ETL package with SSIS, which is SQL Server Integration Services. And this actually ties well to the first question we had, which was on things that Microsoft Fabric and kind of things going back to that more traditional approach. And technically, yes, SSIS is an old technology, but I would say it's based on who's using it. You know, you can have an older technology, but it can still be really effective if you've managed it well, if it's organized. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't use it. However, modern cloud tools like DBT and Snowflake, a little more user-friendly, definitely true. I don't think there's any question about that. I personally also like DBT for the fact that it's more code-based for, for data transformation. Tools like SSIS are graphical, and that makes version controlling and tracking history really difficult to keep, keep an eye on. And, and, and there are some other things. But yeah, the answer is you're not wrong. It is older and these tools are more user-friendly, but that doesn't mean you can't use them. However, if I was starting from scratch right now, I probably wouldn't start here, but if you're using it today and it's working well, you know, you can probably run with that decently far before you need to completely overhaul everything, as long as it's not causing a problem. All right, a few more here. What are we at, 10 minutes, roughly? For SK creation, I wouldn't hash all values in the DIM tables. If you think about which columns make that record unique, you should just use the natural key plus the effective from column it is a composite key made of just these two columns. If you're hashing the entire row, you're kind of repeating the work of the SCD2 pipeline. Otherwise, I also think this SK and the SCT slowly changing dimension dimension is a solid approach, or otherwise, I think, especially helps when you're looking to create a discrete time in the past. But unless I'm missing something, I think there's still a need to use a date range based joins if you're using analysis like show me all sales where a customer moved from the previous 60 days. Yeah, this is a pretty in-depth question here, uh, or a comment. Basically, he's saying you, you could just use the primary key, the unique record IP plus a, and a, a date, and that will give you a unique value, which is true. If that can work for you, then, then go for it. I think a lot of times there are times when there may not be a true natural key, so that can become a problem. So you need to basically own that yourself. I like taking control of the uniqueness in the warehouse. So there may be a unique column in the source that you could use as part of your surrogate key creation. But either way, I still like to create that surrogate key just because again, it gives you control. You know exactly what's being considered unique and you can adjust it as needed. Um, but I think this is a good comment. I don't wanna to get too far into this because I think this is gonna become very circumstantial. Um, you know, like very specific situation. I agree, you don't need to do every single column in a row. If you don't have to, you know, just identify what maybe the few unique ones are and use that. And if you can get away with just two or three, great. If you need a few more, that's okay too. Um, the goal is just to create something unique that you know for all records in the table, it's gonna be unique. But yeah, don't need to do every single column. I recognize it's probably not the best answer, but thanks for the comment. Maybe I'll come back to this one in the future. Okay, great video. Do you think um, in modern data stack, there's a place for both ELT and ETL? ETL for heavy transformations outside of your database, and ELT for lighter transformations within your database with a orchestration layer to act as a control plane. So I think what this is saying is you kind of have two routes. Maybe you know you have one that's more intense, maybe bigger data transformations, and then one for typical batch loading. I, the answer is yes, you could, and anything's possible here. I, again, I can only speak to my approach and the way that I like to go about it, or at least that's what I'm comfortable speaking about. I like to keep one pipeline where I can, kind of having everything landing into one central landing zone and then running on top of that. So in that case, whether you're using Spark to bring it in 
I don't really use Spark much, so I, again, I can't speak to that, unfortunately, too much. But either way, bringing data into, I like loading it into a cloud database, into a law, raw landing zone, and then having transformations on top of that. It just keeps everything consistent in one place that you can track, that you can keep an eye on all of the transformations and, uh, and orchestrate it. And you can have an orchestration layer on top as a control plane. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Again, I start simple. You may not need an orchestration plane right away. And this is actually, as I'm speaking out loud, the fact that you're breaking this up is doable, but you're going to need a now another layer of orchestration. Whereas if you just kind of have one pipeline, you don't, you may not necessarily need a separate orchestration tool or plane right away, maybe in the future, but you could probably get pretty far without it. Maybe it's just a cron job, or maybe it's just a scheduled job on DBT or something like that. So you don't need an extra orchestration layer right away. Again, if you're a smaller team, just getting started, you can totally get away with that. So it almost feels like jump in ahead a lot. Uh, maybe you don't need to. That's always my feedback. Do you need to do this? What are the decisions that are going to be made as a result of you doing it this way as a business? I think as engineers, we like to think about all of the different things we can do. And again, I'm just to be clear, I'm not saying that this is wrong because it very well could be the right decision for you. I'm just explaining. I think as engineers, we'd like to create the most robust, complex version of things by nature. It's fun, it's fun to build. But I would challenge that to say, do you think that you're gonna have better insights or your business stakeholders are going to make different decisions because of this design? Or if you just simplified it into one and had, let's say, a database with some transformations and a batch refresh, would it be 99% the same or 95% the same? And if so, how much is it worth to add an extra side of that pipeline? Again, those are things I think about uh, because then you're getting, you have to have another orchestration layer, which leads to other monitoring, which leads to more human resource maintenance, things like that. So it all kind of compounds on itself if it becomes complicated. But those are my thoughts. Um, always a place for it, but you got to decide if it's worthwhile to approach it from that perspective. All right, let me do one or two more here. All right, a hash key is slow. Why not use auto incrementing surrogate key instead? You got a comment here. Auto incrementing surrogate key creates lookup dependencies for keys that prevent per parallelism at low time. It also enforces cons con consistent length where keys are long prehash. So there is a benefit on load in terms of reading and joins in the final product via BI tooling, you are right though. Yeah, so a few things. To say a hash key is slow is not, I mean, relative, I would say, is slower than an auto-incrementing surrogate key, yes. But to say it's slow and that's a slow to the point where it's a problem, I would challenge that to say, have you proven that? Because there are a lot of ways you can, a lot of examples of using a hash key that you could come up with that are really not that slow. If you're using a tool uh, a, a database that's fairly modern in the cloud, like Snowflake or Databricks or BigQuery or anything like this, they're pretty efficient with this. So is it technically slower by maybe a few milliseconds, maybe, but it's not enough to be a problem and really change anything? Unless you're doing dealing with an insane amount of data and really a lot of complexity in the joins and the hashing, it could happen. But I would just challenge you to say that it's not slow to the point where you should not consider it, in my experience. Why not use auto incrementing? Again, I think there was a good response here. You can do this, but the problem is it becomes harder to rebuild things. What I like about using a hash is, as long as you have the same input, you're always gonna get the same output. So you can do things like drop and recreate a table and know for sure that you're gonna have the same, in this case, a hash key, let's say a surrogate key, because the inputs are the same. Whereas if you have an auto incrementing surrogate key, as soon as you rebuild something, it's throwing out the order, it's throwing it off. So you can't quite test it the same. And if you're testing between different environments, you might not have the same auto incrementing surrogate key, you know, one that goes from one, two, three, four, five, in order like that, let's say, is not gonna be the same between environments. But if you're pulling from the same source data, but deploying in different places, you'll get the same hash key if you're using columns, for example. So it's a nice way to make sure that it's the same. I think the term is idempotence. I could be misusing that there, but I think that's a term where it's gonna be the same result based on the same inputs and you can rebuild things uh, over and over again. And it just makes, it's like a more dynamic way to build 
And that's why this has become more popular. And also, I, would, I think the other point here is in terms of space storage, a hash key is going to take up more space as a data type because you're going to have more string characters, you know, compared to an individual ID, auto incrementing ID. It's also, like you said, the joins are more efficient if it's an ID or auto incrementing. But I encourage you to test it, monitor it to see if it's an issue because a lot of times it's just not. That's like something that maybe in previous database setups was an issue, but now is not as big of a deal and not as big of a performance or cost hit. There is a point of diminishing returns though. So if you're dealing with really large data sets, that may not exactly be true, but a lot of the people I work with and talk to, they're not at that level. They're not at that size of data. So this is okay and it works really well for the benefits. So thanks for the comment. All right, one more, I'm gonna do one more. All right, great content, thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Quick question, why not use the snapshot feature in DBT for dimension creation? Good question, and this was one I had too when I was first getting into this. And I think technically you could, although it's not recommended and I don't ever use it for that purpose. It seems like a quick answer, you know, it's doing the slowly changing process for you so you don't have to recreate the logic to compare and create the different columns. So why not just use it in the dimension? Here's the way I think about it. When it comes to the warehouse tables, it's good to have a little bit more control over some of the logic. Whereas here, you're offloading a lot of that to DBT. That's one thing. So I just like to be able to have a little bit more control in the future. You want to change something. It's a little more straightforward. And the point of the dimension is for bringing multiple sources together oftentimes, whereas the point of a snapshot is to be one-to-one -one with a table typically and just track the history of that one table. So if you're having your dimension is just a copy of one table, and then I guess you could, you could figure that part out. But a lot of times dimensions are bringing in multiple tables. And so to just use it for that, you're kind of using it for the, not the purpose it was intended for. And I just think you're you're gonna hit points potentially. I don't I haven't run into this, but I would imagine you're gonna hit points where it gets it done maybe to start, but at some point you wanna add some things to it or you wanna customize things and you wanna rebuild some things and just change it. But by using the snapshot feature, you're kind of locking yourself into some certain settings or use cases. So that's one thing. I think generally speaking, what I think of snapshots, it's it's almost like the same idea where you have a data ingestion tool which will track history of a source. And then when they load it, you can track the history. It'll show those different date columns. To me, a snapshot is basically that same idea, but you, instead of having the data ingestion tool do it, it's the data transformation tool that's figuring that out for you. So I just think as a blanket statement, I would say snapshots are best used and intended to be used on top of source data rather than for when you're joining things and creating custom data modeling. So I would stay away from it if I were you. But thanks for the question. All right, well, that brings us to the end. Maybe we'll do this again if you find this helpful. Thanks as always for watching and please leave comments. You know, I can go through and answer these again in the future. But with that said, thanks for watching and I'll see you at the next video.